The Roman Catholic Church has been the decisive spiritual influence of Western Christianity. Along with Eastern Orthodoxy and Protestantism, it is one of the three branches of the Christian faith. The Roman Catholic Church traces its roots back to the person of Jesus Christ himself, along with his apostles. The Rome number of Roman Catholics in the world currently number over 1.1 billion, making it the largest group of Christians in the entire world, and one of the largest affiliated organizations in the, also in the world. There are more Roman Catholics than all other Christians combined. As far as our local history in California here goes, in 1769, the Spanish Franciscan Junipero Serra founded the first mission in San Diego, the first of 22 stations that would go up along the California coast. St. Mary's Church, here behind me, was established in 1947, but is part of a Northern California diocese that has been around since 1886. One of the ways that we can talk about Roman Catholic doctrine is to consider it in contrast to our own Protestant teaching that we, most of us are familiar with. The most important thing that we have in common is that we all affirm the Athanasian Creed, the Apostles' Creed, and the Nicene Creed which cover, as we know from this class, the core tenets of our faith. So the most important things we have in common. We also have in common two sacraments, that of baptism and marriage. These are the only sacraments that Protestants recognize, which leads us to the differences. Catholics affirm that there are six sacraments, baptism, confirmation, anointing of the sick, the Holy Eucharist, reconciliation, and then holy orders or matrimony, depending on if you become a priest or you get married. They also have the belief that their tradition it has the same authority as that of scripture. They have a centrality of the Eucharist during Mass, which means that their entire worship service centers around communion, which they believe in transubstantiation, which is different than our Protestant, most Protestants. They believe that the blessing of the priest makes it the actual flesh and actual blood of Christ. They also venerate Mary and other saints. They believe that they hear our prayers and are able to intercede for us whereas Protestants believe that only Christ is able to intercede for us before the Father. They also believe in purgatory. Now, this doesn't have to do with salvation. Those who are in purgatory are assured of their salvation. But what this is, is kind of a final attempt to cleanse the soul, to be presented righteous and holy before a holy God. Whereas Protestants, we believe that Christ's righteousness um, in dying for us on the cross covers all of our sins and makes us able to be with him immediately upon death. They also have a list of minimum requirements for Catholics, which is found in, their, um, in some of their confessional statements, as well as their catechism. The minimum requirements are to attend Mass on Sundays and Holy Days and rest from labor on those days, to confess your sins at least once per year, to partake in the Eucharist at least during Eastertide, to uh, fast and to abstain on whatever days the Church says, and as well as to help provide for the needs of the Church. I learned about influential core rituals and practice in attending a worship service at this church. The first thing I noticed was the liturgy. I needed a beginner's cheat sheet that I found in the back of my seat. I definitely felt like what James K.A. Smith talked about in our textbook about being dropped in as an alien invader. I was very unfamiliar with their customs. I didn't seem to know the right times to stand or kneel. The cheat sheet helped a lot. I also ended up finding out that in the front of the hymnal, we were in week two of Lent, and so the entire liturgy was printed there as well. I noticed a lot of embodied practices. There's standing, there's sitting, there's kneeling, and there's singing, and these would all be formational practices. There was also something that was different that I noticed is that there's a time of quiet reflection before the mass begins. People don't walk in and start talking to each other and greeting each other and asking about their day. Instead, Everyone was very solemn and very quiet. People would cross themselves and kneel before scooting down the pew, as well as spending time in prayer and preparing themselves for what was about to come. The Eucharist, as I had mentioned, was the main event, and it was very clear that the entire service was organized around it. There was a short homily, only about 15 minutes, which is really different for me from the CRC tradition of which I'm a part, that places really heavy value on preaching and exposition of the word. There was also architectural icon and iconography that made a difference in the worship space. As you can see behind me, there's a large vertical space. It elevates your gaze and it makes you feel small. There's stained glass and art, a lot of beauty in this space that sets it apart from the outside world. There were kneelers. Um, I didn't know when to use them exactly, but I would try to join in when everyone else was. 
but they give a sense of um, appropriate reverence in the space. There are wooden plaques that are um, engraved with the stations of the cross around the outsides um, or along the ceiling of the pews. Um, I saw in the bulletin that there was a time that you could actually sign up for a class about praying the stations of the cross. There's a Virgin Mary statue with candles that you could light um, to pray. They really believe in this communication that we have with the great cloud of witnesses that surrounds us. There's also holy water when you walked in and people would touch the water and cross themselves with it. And even when leaving, there were even little bottles that you could fill to bring with you. I'm not sure what that was for exactly, but I did like the feeling of um, being reminded of your baptism in that space. These rituals direct worshipers toward their ultimate love in a variety of ways. First, the embodied liturgy, like Jamie Smith says, pulls at us in a different way. It gets us at a gut level. It creates powerful mnemonics, the standing, the kneeling, the sitting, the singing. These things grab us in a different way, and they teach us the words of our faith and plant us into a larger story in a different way. It creates a muscle memory that makes the creeds second nature. I noticed I was one of the only people that had to refer to the cheat sheet in order to recite the Nicene Creed. The time of reflection, instead of greeting and being a time of commotion before the service, the time of reflection helped prepare one's heart in prayer, gave a time of introspection for receiving communion. It cast an appropriate sense of reverence over the congregation. Also, the centrality of the Eucharist in the Mass, the coming forward of the entire body, the way the elements are treated with such reverence. It wasn't something where you just took the host or took the cup and then it was set aside. But even at the end, the plate that the host was on is carefully cleaned. The cup is carefully wiped out. Because if you believe that's the true bread, the true flesh and the true blood of Christ, it's not something that's gonna be just swept onto the carpet. And it helps you feel the reverence in a different way. There's also a way that I felt that was kind of hard to name. It was a sacred space that felt different than my own experience of communion in my home church. This clear delineation of sacred space helps us realize that this world is not truly our home. This grabbed me at that level of desire like Jamie Smith talked about. I wanted to, uh, to be a part of this ordered, beautiful, peaceful, holy space, especially by comparison to the very ordinary and difficult world outside the doors. I do think there is a danger of disformation here, that people could learn these practices and think of them as being rooted to this physical space instead of bringing them with them out into the world around them. I also had the opportunity to interview a sexton, who is one who guards the church edifice, its treasures, vestments, and as an inferior minister, attends, attends to burials, bell ringings, and similar offices about the church. I thought he had a beautiful answer to the question about how their beliefs shape their ultimate love. He wrote, how love shapes our lives is best captured by the Latin phrase, lex orandi, lex credendi, lex vivendi, which means as we worship, so we believe, so we live. In other words, how we worship reflects what we believe and determines how we will live. Our faith should deepen our relationships with God, transforming us to carry on Christ's redemptive mission by giving ourselves in loving service to those we encounter in our lives. Jesus commanded us to love one another as he loved us. But love just isn't keeping commandments and rules, it's a way of life. It must be an internal attitude that influences every single thing we do and say and think. To me, it sounded like he took a page right out of Jamie Smith's book. After studying the Roman Catholic Church, as well as attending a worship service, there are some takeaways that I got personally that I think would help shape worshipers' desire within my own church family. First is this sense of embodied practice versus only a cerebral practice. From the CRC tradition of which I'm a part, I think we can tend to place almost an overemphasis on the cerebral. We want to understand things. We want to know things. We place a lot of value on preaching. And these are all really good things. But I think there's something that we can lack with losing out on embodied practice, the standing, the kneeling, the sense of beauty in a space. Which leads me into my second thing, the beautiful versus the utilitarian spaces. Now, my home church was built in the 70s, and it is definitely utilitarian in design. I think there was actually some sort of warehouse that went out of business that we got most of our cabinets from at some point for free. So there's a sense of frugality that I think 
we could learn from the Catholic Church that there's a point in investing in beauty, that there's a value there. This church building was built, I think, less than 10 years ago, replacing the original St. Mary's that was built in 1947. I think that my home church could benefit from some beauty in our worship space as well. And finally, the storied versus the individual experience. I think a lot of people go to church wanting to take away that special word that came just for them, or feeling like the preacher spoke just to them in that sermon, or that worship just moved them so deeply, personally. And I think there's a sense of a corporate gathering that's really important that we can miss out on, that we are part of a larger story here. And I got that feeling when I was in Catholic worship, as everyone corporately is kneeling together, everyone's repeating the same words during the liturgy. There's a sense of family, of being placed in the bigger story of God, but also in the larger family of God that I think we would also benefit from. I really enjoyed my time studying the Roman Catholic Church and hope that more of us can learn from these brothers and sisters of ours that make up such a large population within the Christian community.